Hey, good day, it's Prezzy here. Welcome back to the shop and uh, look at what happened to my sticker wall since the last video. I showed in the last one I got some stickers from Craig down in Tasmania, Craig's workshop, and uh, a tool that I bought from a company called Boring Research. And since then I've had offers from all sorts of YouTube machinists and uh, YouTube hobbyists who've offered to send me stickers and I've swapped mine with them. But the majority of these came from John Creasy. And thanks John, uh, certainly bulked out my wall. <laughs> and uh, let's have a look at some of the ones that went up uh, since the last video. Well, there's a close up look and I'm sure you've seen a lot of these stickers before on other people's YouTube channels. So thanks to John for sending me all of these stickers. Unfortunately, John doesn't have a sticker of his own, but he's very active on the YouTube Machinist Facebook group, and so is Emma Ritson, who runs Emma's Spare Room Machine Shop. I'm sure you've probably seen some of her videos before if you're into model engineering. This one here was sent to me by a gentleman named Lance, who runs a channel called Bundy Bear's Shed. Uh, Bundaberg is a, a little uh, uh, regional town not far from where I live, and they make that wonderful Bundaberg rum. But uh, Lance is into Ferguson tractors and tractors in general, and they did some pretty interesting videos on tractor maintenance and repairs. So there you go, it's all bulking out and I'm getting more in the mail as we speak. So um, I'm happy to put those up there, that's fantastic. Well, guess what the subject of today's video is? And I know I said I was gonna do something different in my last video, but unfortunately this machine is taking up all my time and all the space in the workshop. And until I clear off my welding bench and get all the crap off it, <laughs> I can't start the next project. So what I thought I'd do today is give you a little bit of an update on what's happening with the Bridgeport Mill. And uh, let's go and eat a huge slice of humble pie. Now, I know I've been boring you to death with the process of preparing this milling machine for paint. And what I'm doing at the moment is I'm leaving the top half of the mill intact and I'm only working on the lower half. And the reason for that was I had to do a number of repairs on the oiling system for this machine. So while it was apart, I figured I might as well attack the paintwork and do it sort of semi-properly. And what I've done at this stage is I have sanded back all the original finish and made that as smooth as I could. And then I've gone over the mill with a etch primer, which is this dark gray finish that you can see here, and then a sealer surfacer. The important thing here is that even though you spray on these products, that doesn't help you in getting a smooth finish ready for your top coat. What follows after that is lots and lots of sanding and lots of preparation. And even though I had sanded all of this machine with an orbital sander and, and hand sanded it, there are always going to be imperfections which don't show up until you've got your second coat of finish on. What then follows is uh, a process called putting on a guide coat. Now a guide coat, you can see part of it here. What I used was a, a blue acrylic automotive spray paint and I put that on as a like a light misty coat over the whole machine you then sand that back until all that blue spatter has gone now this is masking tape so it doesn't matter and it's not going to be painted but that'll show you what it looks like and if you've done that process correctly you should get back to this uniform gray color here but what the guide coat does is it highlights any low areas in the finish so if you've got a whole or a like a, a shallow void the blue guide coat will stay there and that tells you that that area has either got to be filled or you need to sand down until all that blue guide coat has gone now this area has been filled there was quite a deep chip there and i've re-sanded that and got that you know reasonably smooth there you can see the darker gray etch primer showing through there and this will need to have another coat of sealer surfacer over the top and the best way of telling whether you've got this right is to use your fingers. They are far more sensitive than your eyes in picking up any little holes or voids. Now there's, there's actually one there. But when I put the next coat of sealer surfacer on, that should take care of that. This product that I've used uh, is a very thick coating. It, it's what they call a high build filler. And with two coats, you can put on a good millimeter of paint and then when you sand that back, you just keep going until you can't feel any imperfections with your fingers. Now on this part of the mill here, it's gone pretty well. I've got that about 90% done. It's going to need a little tiny bit of work after I put the second coat of sealer surfacer on here. And I've done all of the big parts. So I've done the column, the saddle and the knee. 
things like the door that goes on here there's an access panel at the back which has been done that's ready for paint and I've done all of the electrical installation that goes around the side so that's all good uh, but now we need to look at the true disaster of this whole process and here's the culprit right here now this is the knee of the milling machine and for those people who are not familiar with the uh, Bridgeport mill this is the part that supports the table and uh, is jacked up and down with the z-axis elevating screw it's a big heavy casting and it's hollow inside and well you can see for yourself what the problem is <laughs> I posted a picture of this in, on Instagram and sort of begged for help and I've never seen this before when I did my lathe I used exactly the same process I used the same two paints that I've used so far and never had this problem I think part of the issue here is that the knee of the mill on a bridge port contains nearly all of the pressure fed lubrication points and all of that oil and also coolants will gradually seep down into the interior part of this knee and you can see inside here there's, there's access so you can clean all that out but the interior of this was filthy and was full of chips full of oil and I hit that with a pressure cleaner and washed everything out of the inside of it I sprayed it with detergent I scrubbed it before I started any of this process of putting the paint on but the oil has just simply seeped straight through that epoxy coating now that really surprised me because it's an epoxy paint it's it's a thermo setting resin it should form an impervious barrier and yet the oil has come through and interestingly around the side here you can actually see or I can see the patterns which correspond to where the top coat was removed and exposed the filler, the original filler that was under the top coat. Now there was someone on YouTube that commented on this and uh, pointed out I was being very short-sighted in expecting that original filler to be a good substrate for paint and at the time I said no I know what I'm doing I've done this before on my lathe didn't have a problem well it's come back to haunt me what's happened is the the original filler is a mixture of chalk dust and linseed oil and a hardener now, I don't know what the hardener is but it makes that combination of materials go off and set very quickly and it's it's easy to sand back and it's sort of pasty and it fills up a lot of the imperfections in the cast iron but it's like a sponge it will uh, allow oil to seep into it and when the, the milling machine is brand new it's not a problem because there's no oil in the material when they start but when you're repainting a product like this that's what you get now interestingly it's only happened on the knee I haven't found it on the column or the saddle but this is not going to work so remember I said about humble pie well I'm willing to admit when I'm wrong this is going to have to be completely stripped back to bare cast iron to get rid of all that original filler there is no way a top coat is going to adhere to that oily coating so, yep, I was wrong, <laughs> and uh, don't do what I do, or don't do what I did, at least not on a part like this anyway. So, I'm going to get to work now and get all this off, and then we're going to hit it with uh, the edge primer after we have thoroughly, thoroughly cleaned this cast iron. Now, I'm going to use a combination of scrapers and wire wheels and scotch bright wheels, whatever I can to get this off it's going to be a mess it's going to be long and arduous but I just I can't see how I can go forward from this surface and get a good finish damn well there we are that took a total of about 20 minutes to get to this point it actually came off a lot easier than I thought so I used a combination of chipping and scraping and I finished up with one of these very tight wire cup wheels on the angle grinder and then I've run over that again with a coarse flat wheel also in the angle grinder just to try and smooth out any surface imperfections and get a bit of a key for the next process and if you're ever wondering why these have to be filled before you paint them well here's why this is a surface defect in the original iron casting and that would have to be at least eight to ten millimeters deep at that point there that was completely filled and when I started to grind away at that you could just see the filler coming out until we exposed that that huge defect so that's going to take a bit of work to fill that up before I start with the edge primer but this now feels uh, much better I, I can't feel any oil coming out of that I originally thought that that was the problem that the cast iron was soaked with oil 
but now I'm thinking that it's actually the filler. So I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the gentleman that alerted me to this. I think it was on Instagram. But yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, it, that is the problem. Uh, the filler was completely soaked with coolant and oil and it was never going to go away. It was just going to keep coming through the paint. I think this knee casting is nearly ready for paint now. I filled up that huge void that was just there and I used this product. This is uh, Evercoat Easy Sand. It's a two-part product. And uh, with the excess, the leftover, I just did some of these other surfaces. So I've gone about halfway down there. I did around this section of the casting here and put a fillet in that because it was quite rough. Done a fair bit of the underside of the knee and a fair bit of that as well. And uh, the best product I've found for doing this sort of work, for sanding back that uh, easy coat, is this thing. So this is called a sear sponge and these come in about four different grades and different sort of densities but these flex and conform to unusual shapes really well and if you put a sanding block inside them you can sort of get in and around uh, quite large fillets and large radii and get them to sand out really smooth so works really well if you're trying to get an area like this you know get in and around there and the grit on these seems to last indefinitely. Um, it's pretty hard to wear them out actually. And also the, the uh, residue left over from the sanding just simply falls out of it because when you flex it, it just sort of opens the grit and all the rubbish falls out. So I'm gonna get this clean now. We're gonna give that a, a wash down with some, uh, what are we gonna use, some acetone. We're gonna wash that down with acetone. And clear all the dust out of the garage and we'll get a coat of the um, Edge Primer on there. These are products I used on the lathe, which I said I painted five years ago. And this is the original paint that I bought at that time. And the good thing about these two-pack paints is they tend not to go off. If you buy like ordinary oil-based enamel paints or even acrylic paints for that matter, once you expose the contents to air, they will start to harden. And you know the problem when you take a lid off a can of paint that you bought say a year ago it'll have a skin on the surface and you tear the skin off and you mix up what's left underneath and the skin usually contains the hardness so when you mix up what is remaining uh, it never tends to set as well as it did when it was brand new and also the color is often quite different but this, uh, even though I've had it five years and this is half full uh, I can still mix it and spray it and it's fine so this is the epoxy primer or an etch primer. So this is IMEFP400 made by Valspar. This is the associated hardener. This is IMEAP401. These are an industrial product. So you won't find these down at your local hardware store. This one here uh, sets with a dark gray and it's excellent on those difficult to paint materials. So things like cast iron, aluminium and brass. They're always difficult to finish. Steel uh, tends to have an affinity for paint and it's, it seems to adhere quite well on steel but brass and aluminium in particular are very hard to do. But I've never had a situation where this is peeled off or delaminated unless you haven't done the prep properly and that means removing all the oil. This is the, the follow-up coat. This is a, a multi-use surfacer or surface sealer and this one here is HS35. The hardener is HPC1. And this is a slightly lighter grey to the etch primer which allows you to see the different layers as you're sanding. Once you see that dark grey appearing, you know that you've gone into the original coating over the bare metal. So you've got to be a little bit careful. So that's it. That's what I've used. And uh, these weren't cheap either, by the way. But a little bit goes a long way. So on the lathe, I would have only used about uh, probably a third of that mix there. Same with this, and I'll have enough to do the milling machine and there will still be some left over when I'm done. I'm nearly ready now to mix up this etch primer and I'll show you that process, but I won't take you through the sealer surface here because it's essentially the same. Now the gun that I'm using today is a gravity feed gun. This is a uh, Star brand, that's the, uh, the manufacturer. And this one has a 600 milliliter cup on top. And these come in three different nozzle sizes and uh, they're a good sturdy gun. They're easy to clean, easy to dismantle 
and they cost about 80 to 90 dollars here in Australia. So that's the gun. The um, other thing you're going to need if you start mixing two-pack paints is a mixing cup. Now I just buy these down at the paint shop. These will do ratios from 2 to 1 up to 10 to 1 and it'll give you the, the levels for each of the two parts. So it's marked A and B and then it has a ratio for the thinners as well and that goes up to 30 percent. Now the thinners that I am using today are just general purpose thinners. You can buy specific thinners for two-pack paints but I've never found them necessary. The purpose of the thinner is just to make the paint a consistency that will flow through the gun. Most of the thinner will actually evaporate off before these two chemicals in the paint start to set. So it really doesn't have a lot of bearing, at least in my experience anyway, on how the paint sets. Now the respirator I'm using on this job is made by a company called Scott Safety and this is a Profile 2 Ready Pack and the filters that I've got on the respirator are Ready Pack A2P2 and these are good for organic vapors and particulates. Now the organic vapors will come from the thinners and some of the carriers in the paint itself and the particulates are going to be the small droplets that get blown up in the air. Now the filters are good for that but they're not going to take out the truly nasty stuff which is the isocyanate and as far as I know there are no filters that will remove that. So if you were painting this in an industrial environment you'd have a pressure fed suit which is delivering clean air from a remote location so that you can breathe it or you'd have to be working in some sort of pressure controlled environment with a water wash wall or something like that. But either way, you need a, a different level of protection if you were spraying this stuff every day. So I'm going to go ahead now and I'm going to get this stuff mixed up. I should really be wearing the re uh, respirator while I'm doing that, but I can't uh, do that and talk to you at the same time. You'll also notice I'm wearing gloves, I'm wearing a, an overall, and I'm going to limit my exposure to this stuff as much as I can. The material we're going to measure out here today is a ratio of 3 to 1, and this is the, uh, the the three part of it, three part of the ratio, and you see here it's really thick and it was like this when I bought it so it's not like this has gone off in the container and this stuff does seem to last very well even though the lid doesn't seal on this very well anymore. Now that stuff is quite thick so I'm sort of stopping short of our mark and I'll let that settle out before I add the hardener. I fluked that, got that really good. <laughs> Alright, let's add our hardener. This stuff is also quite thick. Okay, pretty good there. You do need to mix this thoroughly and make sure you scrape the sides of the cup, make sure you've got all the residue off the edges. All right, now we're going to add our thinners and you need to do this sort of slowly, uh, add it in stages and mix as you go. Now on the measuring cup there are suggested ratios that you can use for 10, 20 and 30 percent thinners. This is going to need a lot more thinners than 30 percent too. So we're just going to add a bit. A lot of this is just experience and trial and error. You can buy special cups or funnels that allow you to check the viscosity of the paint. Uh, I usually start off with probably less thinners than I need and I add a bit as I go. And at this point getting the thinners to mix into the paint can be a, a bit of a pain really. It tends to float around at the top. Just keep at it and it will eventually uh, homogenized with the paint itself. So uh, that's getting close. Now we'll add a bit more.
I've already cleaned this gun, I dismantled it, blew out all the passages, made sure there's no residue inside any of the parts. And if you're going to use these paints, it's worthwhile getting these little disposable filters. And this is not so much about worrying about getting particles in the paint that end up on the work. This is more about making sure you don't clog the gun with a, you know, a blob of paint, which can be really frustrating because then you've got to empty it out, clean it, get it all back together again. So I'm going to pour our mixed paint in through the filter. And the thing about this stuff is you've got to estimate how much you need. Uh, if you mix up too much, it's going to go off. You can't put it back in the container. If you don't have enough, you've got to remix. So I usually keep that paint mixing cup and just in case I need to come back and do some more. Okay, should be ready to paint. Okay, I'm ready to go here now. I've got the part out uh, close to the garage doors, which are all open, and I've got a door open on my left, so I've got good cross ventilation in the work area. Now this gun is empty, but I'm just using this one to show you how I put the paint on. Now, forgive me if you're a professional painter, uh, you're going to look at what I'm doing and say, well, that's wrong. But the technique I'm showing you is one that I used to teach students and they seem to pick it up very easily and get good results with minimal training. So with these guns there is a trigger which has two positions. So when you pull it back you'll feel some resistance and it hits a stop which is actually the, the main needle valve and that will deliver air but only air. If you pull it back all the way to the stop then you're going to get paint coming out of the gun as well as the air. And with this process, what you need to do is imagine that the nozzle of the gun being about one hand span from the work. So if you put your thumb on the tip of the nozzle, where your little finger is, that should be where the work is. That's, that's a rough guide anyway. The other thing is that you hold the gun off the part, then you pull the trigger back fully all the way to the stop and then start moving. And don't release the trigger until you've moved past the right hand edge, in, in my case. So once again, trigger on, move it past the part and then release the trigger. And you need to move, move the gun so that it's parallel to the surface. So if you can imagine, uh, if you just pivot your wrist, you're going to get an arc traced out by the tip of the gun. But it's got to be a linear movement like that. So after you've done your first pass across that surface there, you'll see a band of paint and it should be around about 100 millimetres wide and then you move down by about two-thirds to three-quarters of that width and you do your second pass then move down do your next pass and so on so you're tracing out a zigzag pattern across that surface there and like I say that's not how professional painters do it but it's a it's a methodical technique that beginners seem to pick up very quickly okay so I'm gonna get this hooked up to the air get my respirator on we'll get some paint on this thing
That's been sitting for about half an hour now and that's already touched dry and that's the good thing about these two pack paints is that they cure. It's not a drying process. We're not sort of waiting for solvents to evaporate out or for oils to harden. This is this is actually a thermo setting resin which cures. So this will need rubbing back with some scotch Brite just to abrade the surface before we put the sealer on. And then we're going to have to go through that process of getting that sanded dead smooth or at least getting rid of all the imperfections. Now there you go, I feel much, much better. This is the knee casting now after two coats of that sealer surfacer. It's got a slightly shiny feel to it now and this is ready for a final rub down before we put our top coat on here. So I'm going to do a guide coat on this and then I'll hit it with one of those sear sponges, get the surface smooth, I'll do any minor spot filling that needs to be done on this and it's ready for vinyl coats, I hope. So the guide coat will be this material, it's just a multi-purpose acrylic paint, doesn't really matter what it is, you just want something that's going to be quick drying and a contrasting colour to the grey. That's all that needs, we'll let that dry and then sand that right back and remember any of the blue paint that's remaining there now will mean that's a low spot and needs to be filled or sanded through. This is the casting for the Z-axis elevating screw so I'll do the same thing, we'll get a guide coat on that. So that's it, it's nothing special really, it's just a sort of a visual aid when you're doing your final rub down just to make sure you haven't left anything behind. That guide coat is set enough now that I can start sanding this back and you sort of see straight away why you need it. So here's an area that uh, I haven't done yet. There's a good example of the sort of defect that you're trying to remove when you're doing this process. So, so that's a low spot. If I keep sanding that, gradually it starts to disappear. So when there's no trace of that left, you know you've got that area pretty well flat. And of course running your fingers over that, you can sort of verify that too. So I'm in for a, a lot of work here. Um, this casting was pretty bad probably going to need some local filling as well but I'm pretty sure we're on track to get this looking nice so I'm going to get to work on that now got one more thing to show you before we knock off here and then uh, we'll call it a wrap well just uh, to wrap up this arrived in the mail today and because of the COVID-19 restrictions it's taken a while to get here I ordered this on Amazon and I'll put a link in the description below and this book is not an officially sanctioned uh, Bridgeport publication but it is nonetheless very very comprehensive and uh, it covers not only the disassembly but also the reassembly which is really important obviously <laughs> want the thing to go back together and there are good clear diagrams and photographs there are you know, the text is easy to read it's written in plain english and uh, there are sections which cover uh, the lubrication system there's complete breakdown of all the uh, spare parts the part numbers there are exploded drawings of the different assemblies and sub-assemblies. There's a section on how to repair uh, any damage to the table. So this is going to be excellent bedside reading, I, I imagine. There's a section on how to repair damage to the bed. So there you go, that's, uh, that's the book that I was waiting for. It was recommended to me. And now that I've got it, I've got a, a very good guide for working on this machine. Now there is another version of this which covers the step pulley head. This is for the, the very speed drive head. There you go, that's, uh, that's the book that you want. And uh, thanks for joining me. I'll catch you on the next video. Okay, it's Preso, over and out.